I'm Martin Lee with Project CBD, and this is another edition of Cannabis Conversations. Today, we're very pleased to have Dr. Ethan Rousseau back in the studio with us. Uh, Dr. Ethan Rousseau is a neurologist, a scientist, widely published author in many peer-reviewed journals, and currently a director of research and development for the International uh, Cannabis and Cannabinoid Institute, which is located in Prague of the Czech Republic. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ethan. It's a pleasure to be here. Ethan, there's been an explosion of interest in CBD lately. Um, explain what the excitement is about. What is CBD? Well, first of all, this has been long in coming. Uh, for probably 40 years now, the real concentration of breeding has been towards THC, the main psychoactive ingredient of cannabis. Unfortunately, a lot of that is a byproduct of prohibition. The market was driven by people in the recreational sphere that were looking for escape mm -hmm. or sometimes medical use. Um, and in the process, a lot of the benefit of cannabis was lost uh, genetically because uh, customarily, in many parts of the world where cannabis was grown, it was typically a plant that had equal amounts of tetrahydrocannabinol, the main psychoactive ingredient in cannabis, and cannabidiol. So what is cannabidiol? Cannabidiol is frequently mischaracterized as being non-psychoactive. Rather, it is psychoactive. It is an anti-anxiety agent, an anti-psychotic agent, but it also complements a great number of the effects of THC in that both are analgesics, painkillers, both are anti-inflammatory, and because cannabidiol has this ability to counteract some of the prominent side effects of THC, it's a very valuable thing to have in any cannabis preparation, whether it's predominant or in conjunction with THC. Um, it is a very versatile compound. Uh, it has a lot of effects, but unlike most drugs that have multiple effects, in this instance, it's very hard to pick out any particular side effect of CBD that's problematic. The only thing that we can really point to is that in extreme doses, when it's used in isolation, it can produce some drug-drug interactions, such as producing sedation uh, with drugs like clobazam that are used uh, to treat severe seizure disorders. But on its own, um, it uh, does not uh, produce anxiety, rather treats it. Uh, it's really hard to come up with a significant side effect that we need to warn people about. Of course, it depends on the preparation uh, and other ingredients may be prone to side effects, so we have to be careful in that regard. Now you refer to both THC, the high causer, so to speak, and CBD in the same breath. Um, uh, that suggests that they work together in some way. And there's this phrase, the entourage effect or ensemble effect. Explain that what, what that is in terms right. of the cannabis plant. So cannabis is a botanical. This is a way of saying that it's a plant-based medicine. And although the thrust of pharmaceutical development for decades has been on single molecules, often synthetic, this is the more common concept in medicine historically. What I mean is, traditionally, people have used plant drugs to treat their problems, and it's only been in the last 75 years there's been this shift towards synthetics. So a botanical doesn't rely on one compound to produce the beneficial effects. Rather, there may be many, and that's certainly the case in cannabis, where we know that there are actually uh, over a hundred related molecules we call cannabinoids, uh, but in addition, there are aromatic compounds 
uh, same things that you'd find in lemon and pine needles uh, called terpenoids that alter the effects uh, of the cannabinoids in a way that often is synergistic. Synergy is a boosting of effect. So it would be the idea that two plus two, instead of equaling four, gives you an eight in terms of the benefit. So for example, uh, as we've mentioned, cannabidiol treats pain, but there are other ingredients in, in cannabis uh, that also treat pain or may limit the side effects of other components. And so it is sort of like an ensemble of musical instruments where you might think of THC as a soloist um, with an important part provided by cannabidiol, but you also have these other components producing a harmony uh, that really uh, increases the overall effect and makes hopefully the best possible medicine. And you refer to pain, you know, we are in the midst of a painkiller epidemic, really. Uh, it's well known now. We have uh, many overdoses uh, due to addiction to opioids. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that in terms of what cannabis might right. bring to the table in terms of addressing this crisis. Right. This is a, an absolute uh, medical crisis in that 72,000 Americans died of opioid-related overdoses in 2017. Um, we have known, and this may come as a surprise to almost everyone, it's been known for 150 years that cannabis is capable of uh, acting in concert with opioids to treat pain and allowing what's called opioid sparing. This means a lower dose producing the same uh, or better level of pain control. Additionally, it was observed in the 19th century that cannabis could treat withdrawal symptoms from opioids and other addictive drugs, reduce craving, and allow people to get off of them entirely. The same thing has been observed for decades uh, in people who've used cannabis medicinally. Um, but again, until recently, that was primarily with THC-predominant cannabis, which did work in this regard. But the real missing ingredient until, say, the last decade has been cannabidiol. Because cannabidiol, on its own, uh, acts as an anti-addictive substance. It actually works on an area of the brain called the insula that reduces craving. Um, particularly in combination with THC, we've seen a really amazing response in patients to reduce their opioid doses and often get off of opioids that they may have used chronically. Additionally, there's another component in cannabis, a terpenoid called caryophylline, that also is anti-addictive through a totally different mechanism than CBD. It's working on another receptor called the CB2 receptor that's involved in addiction. So a uh, preparation that had THC, CBD, and caryophylline may be an ideal way uh, of dealing with chronic pain and particularly uh, people who are addicted to opioids. You mentioned CB2 receptor, you're referring to a cannabinoid receptor, uh, which right. is part of something we refer to as the endocannabinoid system. Could you basically define that or describe sure. what that is and why it's important? Okay, so we have this thing in our bodies and all mammals and a lot of lower animals, uh, anything that has a, a spinal cord basically, has an endocannabinoid system. This came about through research on cannabis and specifically THC. Um, so in 1998, uh, it was discovered that there were endogenous cannabinoids. Uh, the first one was called anandamide. Uh, ananda in Sanskrit means bliss. Um, then a couple of years later, it was observed that there was a cannabinoid receptor that was named CB1, cannabinoid 1. Very shortly thereafter, a second receptor, a non-psychoactive receptor called CB2, was discovered that is involved in inflammatory responses, pain control, and uh, limiting fibrosis, the buildup of scar tissue in the body. Um, so, THC works on CB1 and CB2. Caryophylline works just on CB2 with no effect on CB1. 
So certainly with adequate amounts of it, it has this ability to treat pain, inflammation, and addiction without producing any unwanted psychoactive side effects. And when I, when I say that, I mean anxiety, paranoia, the things that we associate with a situation where someone has too much THC. And what about CBD? Does it also um, bind or activate these receptors that you refer to? Or how does it work? Well, that's really interesting, a little complicated. So CBD does not bind directly to the regular sites on either CB1 or CB2. On CB1, it does bind to another site called the allosteric site. And allo means other. When it does bind to this allosteric receptor, it produces what's called a negative modulation. Functionally, what this means is when CBD is present, it's a little harder for THC to bind uh, to the CB1 receptor. Now that really would make it sound like it's gonna interfere with the benefits of THC on pain and other conditions, but that's not what we see. What we see though, when CBD is combined with THC, is a blunting of the peak high. If someone smoked material with both THC and CBD, they're not gonna get quite as high as they would with THC alone. But much more importantly, the effect is prolonged. And in medical settings, this is very important because it allows people to say, dose with an oral preparation, perhaps two or three times a day, as opposed to smoking uh, medicine where they might have to uh, utilize it every two to three hours because of a higher peak and uh, peaks and valleys of activity rather than a, a smoother contour of effect, which is much preferable in a medical setting. I have lots of questions I'd love to ask, but I think we have time for one more. Um, it, I believe in the Ayurvedic uh, Indian medical tradition, the traditional Chinese medicine, there's an emphasis on the gut, the idea that sort of health is rooted in the gut. And we hear a lot these days uh, the buzzword about the microbiome, the, the bacteria, beneficial or otherwise, in the gut and the role that that plays in terms of health. Does the endocannabinoid system play into this at all, and if so, how? Uh, well, yes, it does in a very important way. Um, there's been some very interesting work done recently um, that shows that the microbiome, which is a collection of, of natural bacteria in the gut, uh, has a great deal to do with our health overall. Uh, whether someone uh, has problems with inflammation or not, um, it provides neurotransmitters that, that uh, go to the brain, uh, affects our mood very, in a very key way. Uh, it's very involved in, in, in autoimmune diseases. What it was found is that THC actually stimulates production of some of the more beneficial bacteria and suppresses uh, the disease-causing uh, bacteria like Clostridia. Uh, that produces uh, severe diarrhea syndrome. And that's THC in particular does that. Uh, that's right. And CBD, do they know how it um, plays into it? or we, We've got a little less knowledge yet. However, um, there seems to be a key role for the microbiome or gut bacteria in endocannabinoid tone. Mm -hmm. Endocannabinoid tone is a function of how many receptors, uh, say CB1 receptors, are active in the brain, uh, the amount of the endocannabinoids like anandamide and 2-arachidonoglycerol, and also the function of the enzymes that make these substances and break them down. So it's a very important concept. Um, we can define it. Right now, we don't have good methods of measuring it. We can do uh, serum levels of endocannabinoids in the blood, but it might not reflect what's going on in the brain. And today, I'm afraid we don't have a scan of the brain yet uh, to show the activity of the receptors. But these are research projects um, that hopefully are going give to give us better diagnostics in the future. Um, the implication is that, I mean, maybe it's so obvious we don't have to say it, but our diet 
uh, is key to our health, and that the endocannabinoid system mediates that, whether for good or ill, in some way. Is that well? A- yeah, that's absolutely right, and this is one reason you see a lot of emphasis now. Uh, people may see, see ads on TV for what are called probiotics. Mm-hmm. This is a way of taking a supplement by mouth that's going to provide, hopefully, more of these beneficial bacteria. Um, But uh, those beneficial bacteria need something to eat, and it isn't always what we have in the American diet. The American diet, I'm afraid, with a lot of fried food um, and carbohydrates, um, upsets the balance of the bacteria in the gut and favors production of inflammation. If, however, people are eating certain foods called prebiotics uh, that tend to be non-digestible fibers, this is what the beneficial bacteria really like. Uh, And when they're functioning well, it is, we have good evidence now, going to increase the endocannabinoid tone and really contribute to overall health. I think that's good food for thought, and I want to thank you, Dr. Russo. You've been a great educator for our community, and we appreciate it very much. So, Ethan, if people want to uh, contact you, learn more about the work that you're doing, how would they reach you? Well, probably the best way would be through the ICCI website. And it's been another edition of Cannabis Conversations. Hopefully, we'll do more with you in the future. Thank you.